literally waiting for the next second for it to turn to be 8.30, and then we start. It will do both. It will both complicate your life and make it easier. It will do every technological advance does. Okay, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here for the Wednesday morning Torah class, and this morning, we're going to spend the entire class on one phrase. So if you would like to take a look at the phrase, you can open to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, and Parshat Mishpatim, uh, and the exact verse is found page uh, on uh, chapter 21, verse 12, start with, uh, 20, yeah, let's just do 23, and then we'll look at the surrounding verses. But if other damage ensues, this is talking about when two men are fighting, um, and, uh, and then um, a pregnant woman is pushed and a miscarriage results, or there's other damage, if other damage ensues, the penalty shall be for Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. And what I want to focus on is ayin tachat ayin, eye for eye. Um, what does it mean when the Torah says an eye for an eye? Uh, this is one of the most famous phrases in the Torah. Um, Gandhi famously said, you know, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. Uh, Gandhi was not a, uh, a fan generally of uh, Jewish scriptures, um, but I think that's because he didn't understand them. Um, I really do believe that, uh, but, uh, but that's a separate question. Um, the other time this occurs, by the way, is in Leviticus 24.17. For those of you who are interested, it occurs twice. Um, and he who kills a beast shall make a good life for life. And if a man maim his neighbor as he has done, so shall it be done for him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has maimed a man, so it shall be done to him. So in other words, the automatic, unreflective assumption of this, um, of this uh, phrase is that if you... Um, blind someone, or if you take out their eye, that the punishment of the court is that they take out your eye. So the Talmud has none of this, does not accept this. And it gives several separate arguments for why eye for eye does not mean eye for eye. Um, and I'm going to present them to you along with a little bit of commentary. And then at the end, of course, we'll take questions. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai stated, eye for eye, ma mamon, which means money. It says, ayin tachat, ayin mamon, eye for eye, money. You say money, but perhaps it means literally an eye. In that case, if a blind man blinded another crippled, maimed, an cripple blinded another, a cripple maimed another, how would you be able to give an eye for an eye literally? In other words, what happens if a blind man blinds some? knock someone else's eye out. You can't knock his eye out because obviously you can't blind him since he's already blind. That's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It's not the strongest argument against an eye for an eye, but it is an argument. Um, it was taught in the school of Hezekiah, eye for eye, life for life, and not a life for an eye. For should you imagine that eye for eye is literally meant, it would sometimes happen that an eye would be taken for a life because in the process of blinding, the person might die. That's probably true. Remember in ancient times, you, did not, you couldn't surgically remove someone's eye. Um, and who knows what the implications would be. Sajiga On, who was a much later commentator, said as follows. For Rav Sajiga said, we cannot take this text literally. For if a man deprived his fellow of a third of his normal eyesight by his blow, how can the retaliatory blow be so calculated as to have the same result? Neither more nor less, nor blinding him completely. 
Such an exact reproduction of the effect is even more difficult than in the case of a wound or a bruise, which, if in a dangerous spot, might result in death. So, and then he gives several examples in the Torah where someone says, as they did to me, so I will do to them, but they don't do identical things. Like Samson is one example, but there are many others where the punishment that's given to him by the Philistines is not the punishment he returns to them. And so his reigning assumption is that like an eye for an eye is a metaphor, just like when you say, I'm burning up. We're not really burning up. You could be upset, but you're not literally burning up. And they understand the Torah to be using this as, in other words, you should mete out appropriate punishment for somebody who does X, Y, or Z. So, for example, it says, um, Scripture states, here's one more proof from the Talmud. You shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death. In other words, if you kill someone, you can't pay their family money to compensate for that, right? Torah has capital punishment. But that implies that for the life of a murderer, you may not take ransom, but you may take ransom for other injuries that you do to someone. So again, another proof that an eye for an eye doesn't mean an eye for an eye. It means if you put out someone's eye, then you pay them compensation. And this is Maimonides on the same verse. Wait, we've got more. Whence is the statement an eye for an eye compens proved that mon monetary compensation? Since it is stated bruise for bruise, and we know explicitly if a man, and this is in Exodus, again, the passage we read, if a man strikes his fellow with a stone or a fist, he shall pay for loss of time and have him thoroughly healed, indicating that for a bruise refers to pay payment and the same mean is true for other limbs. Okay, now, all of this is really interesting and the, the, the Talmud goes on for, at some length to prove that an eye for an eye doesn't mean an eye for an eye, and you can understand why, right? Because that kind of brutal judgment isn't generally the way um, Jewish law works. But here's a really, if you look at the text itself, a more interesting proof. Okay. <clears throat> look at uh, 20, let's say. <clears throat> at 18, rather. When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or a fist, and he doesn't die, but he has to take to his bed. If he gets up and walks outdoors upon his staff, the assailant shall be unpunished, except he has to pay for his idleness and his cure, right? He has to pay for the time off of work and he has to pay his medical bills. That's 21, uh, 18 and 19. Now, 21, 20, when a man strikes his slave, male or female with a rod, and he dies there and then, got it? Book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, chapter 21, verse 20. Now, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and he dies there and then, he must be avenged. But if he survives a day or two, he's not to be avenged, since he's the other's property. When men fight, one of them pushes a pregnant woman and miscarriage results, and no other damage ensues, the one responsible shall be fined according to the woman May husband may exact to him the payment based on reckoning. But if other damage ensues, the penalty shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, you realize that the first two instances, right, are deliberate. That is, both times people are fighting and they're trying to hurt the other person. When a man quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or a fist, or when a man strikes his slave, okay? Those are deliberate. And yet, in both those cases, you pay monetary compensation. So why would it be in the third case, when men fight and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and miscarriage results or other, dam or other damage ensues? In other words, where it's accidental, why would it be a more severe punishment? If in cases where it's, act, where it's on purpose you pay comp monetary compensation, surely in a case where it's accidental, 
you would pay monetary compensation. That is the argument of a, a modern named Benno Jacob. Um, he says, uh, not, well, first he says, surely in a case with inadvertent action where we're explicitly told that only loss of time and medical care has to be paid for, um, were I for I to be taken literally, um, why would inadvertent maiming be greater than deliberate one, the punishment? And then he also uses a really clever proof that an eye for an eye doesn't mean an eye for an eye. Um, and here is, uh, here's where you see um, the proof. It says in verse 23, okay, everybody got verse 23? If other punishment happens, it says unitana. And what is notain in Hebrew? Anyone know? To give. To give. Right. To give. To give a soul for a soul. That you understand, right? You've heard people say, um, like, he took my child's life so he should die, right? Like a soul for a soul. But, says Jacob, you can't give a hand or give an eye. Like, if you, if you cut off my hand, you don't give me your hand. There's no exchange. The only thing you can give me is monetary compensation. So the word there, give, already implies that it's monetary compensation. And the word tachat, which means for, often means giving something that isn't equivalent. Um, so, for example, when... Uh, when Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac. He sacrifices a ram, tachat Isaac, which means in place of Isaac. So, ayin tachat ayin, you can't give an eye in place of an eye. You can only give monetary compensation in place of an eye. Now, I bring all of this up because it shows you in one of the most dramatic ways that you can see that the interpretation that the Torah gives... Um, but, oh, I forgot one, one small and cute one. Uh, also, like some of the rabbi's arguments may seem implausible to you, but when arguments seem implausible to them, they, they note it. One rabbi um, in, in the Talmud says, also, by the way, someone might have a big eye and someone else might have a small eye. So obviously you couldn't. And, and one of the other rabbis says, that's ridiculous. The equivalent of that's ridiculous. He says, when you're talking about capital punishment, you don't say, well, the guy he killed was small and he's big, so we obviously can't kill him because you'd be killing a bigger person. Um, he said the, the issue is vision, not the size of the eye. Um, I, I, I assume the other rabbi felt a little ashamed. But nonetheless, the, the point of all this is you see that the, the rabbis, when they have a problem with a verse or the implication of a verse, they go to work over and over and over and over again to prove that the verse doesn't mean what the verse seems to mean. And this is a tendency throughout the Torah, and it's the reason that we're a rabbinic tradition and we're not a Torah tradition, because the Torah means in Judaism what the rabbis say the Torah means. And it doesn't mean, and, and we don't have this, it's a Protestant tradition of solo scriptura. No rabbi ever says to you, just open the Bible. And I mean, unless it's, you know, am I allowed to murder? They might say, open the Bible, it'll tell you. But for any sophisticated question, it's always rabbinic interpretation that makes the Torah mean what it means. And, that, and there have been movements in Jewish history, like the Karaite movement, that tried to return solely to the Torah, but invariably they developed their own interpretations too, because the Torah just does not give you enough information to be able to do it itself, and also because parts of it seem to contradict parts of it, like the fact that the punishment here for what is deliberate seems lesser than the punishment for what is inadvertent. Um, so. I think that this is a really good example, although hardly the on, only example, of the rabbis managing to change the explicit statement in the Torah so much so that they barely entertain the possibility 
that it was meant explicitly. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Any questions or comments about what we've done so far? They went into all of this because they wanted to prove that that wasn't what the Torah meant. All of the world were such savages. If you read, if you read, I don't know how many of you have ever read something like Steven Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature, but he talks about murder rates in medieval times and in ancient times. And, and like the worst neighborhood in the worst city in the world right now is a million times safer than London in the Middle Ages. And that is a million times safer than ancient Assyria. Um, yeah, there was savagery, like it was a commonplace. Uh, even in Neanderthal graves, how often do they find Neanderthal graves and they see that somebody died by violence? Um, so I think that this was, what you're seeing here is a process of civilization. And the greatest leap I always thought um, in civilization was, and it's still hard for people, was if you do something to me, for me to turn my authority to do something back to you over to a court or to a system. Because it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know, those, those uh, feuds that lasted hundreds of years because they would kill one of ours, so we have to kill one of them, and then they'd kill one of ours, and then we'd have to kill two of theirs, and then they'd have to kill three of ours. Um, the natural human inclination is if you hurt something of mine, I'm gonna come back and hurt something of yours. But at a certain point in human history, people realized that, that you couldn't build a society that way and you had to turn it over to a structure that would sometimes disappoint you. And it does sometimes disappoint you. You know, you, someone does something to you and then you don't get to, um, you, and they go free for whatever reason. Uh, so what we're seeing in the time of the Torah is a, is a time of fair free-for-all, which is why there are so many battles in the Torah. Like they come out of, Egypt, the first thing that happens is Amalek attacks them. They come into Israel. The book of Joshua is just filled with battles and attempts at pre peace treaties, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, but that's, life was, you know, nasty, brutish, and short, um, to abbreviate what Thomas Hobbes said. Uh, What's the name of the book again? The, the book. Which book? Oh, Steven Pinker. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Um, and he talks about how, although we're not aware of it, we live in by far the best time in human history to live. Uh, and, um, and the principal reason for that is because the prevalence of crime in ancient time was something that we can't, we, we almost can't imagine how, how uh, universal violence was um, in that time, and this is a, a good example of it. Uh, and also, by the way, the other thing that was universal, as you see in this, was slavery. Um, there was not an ancient society that we're aware of that didn't have slavery and didn't sort of take it for granted. Uh, even slaves took it for granted. It was, I mean, they didn't like being slaves, but nobody said, you know, slavery is wrong and against the law of nature because nobody thought it was. Um, and so, here, we, where there are laws about, about slaves, there are more humane laws than the other societies at the time, but there's still laws about slavery. So much so that, that it seems paradoxical that this book, which is about liberation from slavery, still has slavery in it, but they do. Because in ancient times, if you conquered a people, that's, that was your reward. Your reward was then they worked for you. Um, and uh, and if, you, if you owed somebody money, your reward was they were in, and, and slavery in, for Jewish slaves, you know, has a limitation, right? In the seventh year, you go free unless you want to continue being a slave. And then they literally bore a hole in your ear, like to indicate that you chose this life. But our ideas are really hard to retroject back into the Torah. It was a very different time with different ideas, which leads to the interesting question of what ideas in a thousand years 
well, they think we're primitive, that we think are perfectly natural. Um, I don't know. I have guesses, but who knows? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs>
If it falls on the other side of the boundary, then it's the person on the other side of the boundary. Um, and, uh, and they're just talking, and, and this is in a larger context of, of boundaries and what, what they do mean and what they don't mean and whether if something happens on your side of the boundary, does that really mean that it's, you know, it's entirely within your purview or not and so on. So someone gives the example of the bird. If the bird falls here, it's yours. And so Rabbi Yirmiya says, what if the bird falls and one leg is on this side of the boundary and one leg is on that side of the boundary? And it says, and they kicked him out of the house of study. Because it was like, that, I, 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 and I, I got to believe, either they, cooked, they kicked him out because he was being ridiculous or because he was making a joke that they thought was inappropriate. I don't know which. But the point is, that's very, but that is sort of very much in the Talmudic spirit to, to push it as far as it will go in order to understand. That's why it has real, real life consequences. That's why people have separate dishwashers, right? It says three times in the Torah, you should not boil a lamb in its mother's milk. That's all it says about milk and meat. It doesn't say don't eat a cheeseburger. It says you should not boil a lamb in its mother's milk, which seems humane, right? But the rabbis then go into the, a long, because it says it three times, especially, it must mean more than just don't boil. You can only say that once. And they go into long, elaborate separations then of milk and meat in all sorts of ways so that you never, ever will come close to boiling a lamb in its mother's milk, which you certainly won't do if you have separate dishwashers. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there is just that, that, that Talmudic uh, push the boundary that never changes. Um, anyway, any other questions? Yes. <laughs> That's a big question. All right, I will close with this. Does religion civilize? Um, the, the, you said because people are still, you know, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase. No, people are no damn good. Um, often. So what I would say is we underestimate often the extent to which human impulses can be destructive and bad and evil. Um, and, and even in the most civilized settings, that can be true, right? Um, so does religion make people into angels? No. But do people who take it seriously by and large, live lives that are more moral than those who have no regard for religion? I think yes, with one exception. The one exception is that because religion encourages a certain kind of solidarity and exclusion, it sometimes encourages people to treat those who aren't part of their group badly. But that's true, that's because you have intersecting problems. First, you have the problem of people having selfish motivations, but you also have the problem of people having tribal motivations. So religion has to fight against both. And it's a very difficult fight. It really is a very difficult fight. But I have yet to see evidence that absent religion, people are good. So. I hope so. I'm saying that the Ten Commandments try to civilize. How well they work, it depends. But I mean, for, but, but honestly, when you look, for example, at uh, the Jewish communities of Eastern Europe, were they generally communities that were fairly, they were fairly peaceful, they were fairly, I mean, they weren't as good, we don't, we idealize them, they weren't perfect. But I, yeah, I think generally Judaism created a people that were, that were probably better than they would have been had there been no Judaism, um, that were better than the people surrounding them in ancient times, even though they were hardly perfect, but they were better than the Assyrians. Um, so 
It's not easy to say. Um, there's a very famous, I, I, very famous, a well, fairly well known, a great question and a great answer. So Dennis Prager used to have this question on his radio show where he, I don't know if he still does, asked this, where he said, if it's late at night and you're walking home and you see like three big guys walking behind you, would you or would you not be glad to know that they just came from Bible study class? Okay. So he once asked that from Christopher Hitchens. And Hitchens said, well, it depends where I was in the world. If I was in Beirut, no, I would not be glad to know as an American that they came from a religious study class. If I was in, and then he named like four or five other cities. He said, and that's just the bees, right? Uh, so, so, but I think there you see the perfect contrast that religion can act as this big civilizing force but sometimes it doesn't. So on that complicated yes and no answer, hope to see you next week and uh, an early Shabbat Shalom.